Let's quickly review what we've seen so far. We work with points, and so the difference of the gradient. We work with lines and the line integrands and the line integral of the gradients. We work with closed lines, so we have the closed line integrands of the curl. We work with surfaces, we have the surface integral and the surface integral of the curl. And now next, we'll work, as you can probably tell, on closed surfaces. So we're going to define the closed surface integral in the same way that we define the closed line integral for all of the same reason that closed surfaces are special, they tell us something. The definition is exactly the same as the surface integral, it's just that the surface on which we define the integral is going to be closed. So for example, if our vector field were a velocity field, this would tell us how much uh, the fluid would uh, be concentrating in a region or would be coming away from a region. And in the same way that we looked at the surface integral of the curl, we look at the closed surface integral of the curl. And again, what we saw before is that the surface integral of a curl is just equal to the line integral along the boundary. But the boundary of the closed surface doesn't really exist, it's zero. So the integral around the boundary is also going to be zero. Another way to see this is that we can divide the closed surface integral in two parts the top part and the bottom part. And so we are taking the same boundary one in one direction and one in the other, and so they cancel out, and we still get zero. So any way we look at it, the result is that the closed surface integral of the curl is zero along any surfaces and for any vector field. Next, as you can probably tell, we want to take the closed surface integral and make it a local operation. So we want to take the closed surface and make it small and small. Now, again, as before, we're going to have the problem that the surface integral is going to go to zero. So we're going to divide it by the volume so that the ratio between the two remains finite. Another problem that we're going to have is, again, we have to choose the shape. And again, we don't want to go to the details. We'll just choose a rectangular box, a rectangular parallel pipette. But this time, we don't have to choose a direction for our surface. So our operator is going to be a scalar. So this operation is going to be the divergence, and it takes a vector field and it gives us a scalar field. So let's try and calculate the divergence. So here is our rectangular box of sides dx, dy, and dz, which in general are not going to be the same. We're only going to explicitly calculate the contribution along the x direction. So on this side, we're going to have minus the x component of the field, times the area, which is going to be dy times dz, and we put it here. On this side, we have the x component of the field at x plus dx, times dy and dz, so we put it here. And you can see again, if we rearrange this, that the dy dx is going to cancel out, and what we're going to be left over is the partial derivative of the x component along the x direction. And if we do that for all the other directions and calculate the contribution of the other directions, we get the similar result. So we end up with a known result that the divergence of E is the scalar product between the Nabla operator and the vector field. And then we can also write it in this way for the index notation. The next question is going to be, what is the divergence of a curve? And again, we saw that the divergence is an infinitesimal closed surface integral, and we saw that the closed surface integral of a curl is zero, and therefore the divergence of the curl is always going to be zero. And now again, we ask the opposite question. If we have a vector field for which the divergence is zero everywhere, can we say that that field is the curl of some vector potential? And the answer is yes, but with some caveat. The first caveat is this only works in 3D. As we saw before, the curl of a field is only a vector in 3D, and we have defined the divergence operator on vectors. If we were not in 3D, then this would not be a vector. It would be a scalar in 2D, it would be a rank 2 tensor in 4D. Either we say we really have a vector field, and therefore that can't be a curl of something, or we say we have the curl of the vector field, and this will be a scalar or a tensor depending on the number of dimensions. Now, if we're doing fluid aerodynamic and your vector field is the velocity of an incompressible fluid, then this is the equation that you want to get. You're not going to have a vector potential in general. You're going to have something different called stream functions. 
if you're doing electromagnetism on space-time, for example, you are going to have a four-vector potential, and then your field is not going to be a vector anymore, it's going to be a rank 2 tensor. So these two equations are really different geometrically, and we can only put them together in 3D, and this is also why we can't give you a nice geometrical explanation of why we can do this in 3D. So let's sum up. We have closed surfaces on which define the closed surface integral. We have the divergence, which is an infinitesimal closed surface integral. We saw that the closed surface integral of a curl is always equal to zero. We also saw that if we have a vector field, that it's the curl of another field, then its divergence is zero. And if it's an and if the divergence of a vector field is zero, then we can define a vector potential, but this only can be done in three dimensions. So let's continue. We finish with surfaces and we now have to work on volumes. And we define the volume integral. So this time we're going to work with a scalar field. And the question is, what is the value of that field inside a volume? So again, we take the volume, we divide it into lots of different pieces. For each piece, we get the value of the field. We multiply it for the volume, we sum it up, and we make the volume go down. And this is the definition of the volume integral. And again, if we were to divide by the volume, this would give us the average value of the field inside the volume. The last question that we ask ourselves is, what is the volume integral of a divergence? So again, we take the volume, we chop it up into pieces. The divergence at each point is going to tell us the closed surface integral around that point divided by the volume, so this quantity here. But with the volume integral, we're multiplying this quantity by the volume, so the volume goes away, and we just are summing all the different contributions. So again, each surface inside the, the volume will have a contribution plus an opposite contribution that cancel out. So what we get is just the contribution on the boundary. So we have the volume integral of a divergence is the surface integral on the boundary of the field. And now we can sum up. We define our volume integral and the volume integral of a divergence. So now everything is complete and we can look at some of these patterns. So on the top we have the boundaries, the points, the closed lines, and the closed surfaces. And on the bottom we have uh, the geometrical objects, the line, the surfaces, and the volume. We define the non-local operators of the difference of the closed line integral and the surface line integral on the boundaries. Then we construct the infinitesimal operation from them, and these are the gradient, the curl, and the divergence. Then we have defined the line, the surface, and the volume integrals, and we found that we can apply those on the differential operators to get back at the boundary operators. Now these are usually presented at different theorem. This is called the gradient theorem or the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. This is called the curl theorem or the Green's theorem in two dimension or the Kelvin-Stokes theorem. This is called the divergence theorem or the Gauss's theorem or the Ostrogratz's theorem. They have many names, but these can also be seen as different instantiation of the same theorem, the Stokes theorem, on different geometrical objects and their boundaries. So I hope that seeing all these concepts organized like this gives you a framework to put them together and maybe give you a better intuition for them.